Yeah. So uh, I'm going to come to you, Brenda. And my question is, how can we ensure that digital resilience strategies, Philip really was generous uh, talking about them, addresses the unique challenges faced by women from diverse backgrounds, including uh, uh, tribes, because, I mean, we are from countries where we are talking about tribes, and also socioeconomic status. Yes, that's true. Before, um, I request that before I respond to the question of build up on what Philip said, um, I very much love context. Mm -hmm. And it's important for us, especially for women in media. A recent report by UN Women indicated that, uh, by UN, indicated that 73% of women are suffering online violences. Mm -hmm. Now, the 73 online violences, but we are having 20% of these online violences translating into physical mm -hmm. attack. Mm -hmm. That it comes, for example, from like what uh, Massey mentioned, it comes from just simply a comment of a cyberbullying comment. And the next thing we see is that this comment can translate into a physical attack. And then building up from my sister of Tamwa, that many of them are limited in accessing support systems or rapid response to support them on addressing or combating or responding to the effects of um, online violence that they would have faced, in other words. And the problem, where does it get when we speak again into context, before we get into the demographic factors, because they again speak to the same context, that there are five elements that we need to consider, and the very first thing of it, of it is accessibility. That the urban woman is privileged to have access to the digital spaces. When we look at the other demographic factors, the peri-urban and rural woman is very limited to have accessibility, yet the socioeconomic factors are increasingly evolving to the digital space. Therefore, they are excluded. Those who get the opportunity to be online are limited in understanding how to navigate, now usability, to navigate the online spaces. That even as we are frontiers of information as female journalists, we are also limited. Recently, Philip, I would love to put you on the spot. He made a comment when I was in a Twitter space. For quite a long period of time, I have been struggling to join Twitter spaces, and yet I'm invited into these spaces to either be a speaker or something. And I have to ask my neighbor, who is a male, to help me understand why my Twitter space is not enabling me to join. And in the end, was like, you know what, use my phone to participate in the Twitter space. It took me about three months to understand that the limitation of me getting into these Twitter spaces or these conversations, these public dialogues, is I need to update my app every other time. It was as simple as that, that my Twitter is never updated. So I need to keep updating so that I have the features of joining there. This is Brenda. How many Brendas are out there who are struggling with understanding navigation? Then the second bit of it, that when it comes to usability, in case someone, a woman has faced violence online, recently it has become a tit for tat as a coping mechanism. It is either withdraw or tit for tat. That you bash at me, I bash back at you. What is the implication, for example, of a female journalist or any woman who is directly, who is having work running in form of a brand, you're having a business online that you're running. As a female journalist, you disseminate information largely under a brand that you work for. What is the implication of you bashing back to an online bullying? It means you will either have reduced sales or failed business boycotting by public, or you're going to be fired by your media house because you're compromising the brand of the institution. <coughs> yes, you're looked at as aggressive. Now they start to, term, to you know, to tag you. And if you're a female, it becomes even worse. For example, in Uganda, in the online spaces, they brand you as feminist in the abusiveness of that terminology in the public space. And then we get to the issues of affordability, ladies and gentlemen. Female journalists, for example, and women in the wider context of it, are still struggling with economic factors of empowerment. A recent report from Uganda by a like-minded institution, ACME, released and indicated that journalists averagely in Uganda are earning below 300 US dollars. And I don't think it's any different across the spectrum in Africa. 
Now, if you're earning that less, look here, we are talking about an urban woman at that cost. If you get to the peri very urban, and then the rural areas. And then you're getting also to the education background, the education levels, ETC, ETC, size of the workspace, size of the media house, size of, you know, the economic empowerment of the area, it keeps getting worse. How will they afford the internet costs of thriving or sustaining, you know, a meaningful time in the online space to benefit otherwise? economically to say if it's a business or you know visibility that generates for you back economic implication it is another strong one if we come to away from internet affordability it is the issue of affording gadgets mm. every time during the digital <coughs> trainings that we get one of the elements of trying to adopt or adapt to digital safety and security. We always speak about the kinds of gadgets we have also so that they provide upgraded features to protect us. How many women can afford the phones? We are instead being, you know, social constraints that we continue to exist on, for example, male counterparts, spouses to purchase for us gadgets because we cannot afford in other words. Therefore, we are having lower versions of phones or any form of gadget which exposes us to vulnerability. And then she best put it, Mercy, on the form, and my colleague here on the form of the online gender-based violence, which is an urgency for everyone to draw attention to in terms of addressing. And the issue now points now getting to building up on how do we get to you know, implement what uh, Philip mentioned, especially in the context of diversity when it comes to women. It is the element of coordination in implementation of these responsive strategies that we are developing or interventions. They should not be implemented in isolation because you need to be responsive. Because gender, if you're speaking about gender, you're looking at all these elements. Therefore, you need to be responsive to <coughs> each of these elements in order for it to be meaningful, to generate results. Now, where does the coordination also come to at this point? We are working in silos. Civil society, why we develop initiatives, for example, capacity building. Sometimes it's in isolation, with the increasing repressing laws that we are having that repress in the digital space. Can we try to drive towards constructive working whereby we engage the government on some of the laws that are available? Either laws that are available or laws that are increasingly developed. A case study of Uganda, we are increasingly having so many laws. You know, we had the Computer Misuse Act that Bonita mentioned earlier that was infringing on the rights of the media, which also captures female journalists or any other woman to thrive on the online space. As we are still coping with the Computer Misuse Act, we got the Computer Misuse Amendment Act, now which gets to criminalize any form of dissemination of information that is unsolicited or does not have consent. As we are still battling with that for it to be repealed, the government proposed media reforms. Now, these media reforms have digital laws as well, among which the Data Protection and Privacy Act. It also marginalizes. Can we speak to government systems to engender these laws? <laughs> Engendering them means responsiveness when it reaches the point of implementation. As we are developing civil society, developing these initiatives that we want to implement, can they be responsive to the needs of each individual, each woman whom we need to target, so that they are not only urban based? <coughs> We were having the same conversation with Phil. Yes. We should not make it a conversation for cities. Yes. It should go into the rural areas where the majority of our population live. Because if we, if we go on the way we are, it's going to be an elitist conversation. Yes. yes. It yes. persists at that. And that is another gap that creates the limitation. For me, I think that we should write on the issue of coordinated responsive initiatives. That, for example, if we are looking at the sort of, of what, of um, Aisha? <coughs> If you are looking at Aisha, it should speak to me, an educated person, but it should also speak to that auntie who has gotten this digital device by point of privilege. Mm -hmm. What other coordinated mechanism speaks into that peer-to-peer -peer mm -hmm. training? That we have this, the trainer of trainers, mm -hmm. that for example, perhaps under future of work, the next phase, if we are training, we say that if you are training women politicians, female journalists, 
Can I pick, say, for example, Mercy? And I know that Mercy can ripple down these skills in a relatable way to the group of people that belong in Mercy's profession. If you are speaking to, to, to women politicians, a woman councillor, because politicians are across the board, I'm speaking about an MP, I'm speaking about a councillor. Can I target the councillor to train her? Because I know she has the ability of tripling down these skills. After training her, she can relatably ripple these this knowledge and skills down to the group. Wider reach, but then also meaningful. It's easily relatable. Therefore, it becomes responsive. If we communicate from this high end, it will create a backlash. We keep talking to ourselves. Yes, thank you. Brenda, thank you so much. You've really unpacked that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't think there's anything to add. But I, we said we are having a very intimate conversation because we, we are quite few. And I think I would want to throw this question to everyone in the room. So um, my question would be, how then can we make this um, space inclusive? How can we make... Because also there are men who are offline. You know, how can we make this space inclusive? Inclusive in terms of it meets or it meets my needs. Mm -hmm. You know, as a journalist, when I go online, I have my needs. Mm -hmm. You know, the same way if my niece, who is 14 years old, goes online, she has her needs. So how can we make, make it inclusive that when you go there, your needs are met? I'm not saying that it is Christmas that everyone gets a gift, mm -hmm. you know, but how can we make this space inclusive? Anyone who wants to be philanthropic with their information. I just want to add one other strategy that we have been using in Cameroon that I think is important. It is developing a referral pathway for gender-based violence online, beginning from the victim. If it happens, what do I do? Who are all the stakeholders? Where do I report? Whom do I report to? So we have been able to come out with this referral pathway that victims can use and have the support they need in, in case of online violence. So you start from the victim, you have the stakeholders, what next, even the psychological part of it, remember she was in depression, where to go to, who to meet, what to say, the contact, everything put down. For me, that is a good strategy that has worked well for us because we have been working at the front line during the crisis in Cameroon, which I'm sure you know, as women peace builders, we faced a lot of violence. So the only thing we could do was to come out with that referral part with that worked so well for us now coming um to your question yeah to make it more inclusive to me is to make it um simple to use and user friendly for example i like the example she gave about a twitter space so i was wondering why would somebody not know how to use a twitter space it's because we don't have the information we don't know that to access the twitter space you need to be on the phone and not on the laptop so if we just have that simple information on how we need to use the digital spaces the basic information not even the technical aspects making it friendly that any woman anybody can can access it can use it i mean without feeling you know that it's not for me it's, it's not my job if it's just simple to use i think that is one of the best ways to make it okay so my name is hannah i work with oral data science nigeria um so first is I would say it's necessary for you to understand the different classes of people you have. You have the rural woman, who even as much as we all speak about AI, they don't have network services. And some that even have, that their typical days, I take care of three kids, I drop two in school, I have one, I'm struggling with in the shop, I just want to make my sales. And I probably don't even touch my phone throughout the day. And maybe middle of the night, I just come and scroll through my WhatsApp. Yeah, there's a lot of messages and I just sleep. To wake up to the next day, prepare. That's my day in, day out. You also have a student in the campus who, yeah, as much as you're trying to give me a lot of write-up, I just want a quickie. I want to see something. I want to see infographics. I want to see numbers. Or I want to see stories that are quite relatable. TikTok. I like. I have some of my colleagues or teammates that they're talking about infl inflation via TikTok, and it's quite relatable for someone who is in school. I don't need to read your. F I mean, I see a lot of journalists do that. I try to tell them nobody really wants to read the long article. 
they are lost in between. Also, you have the space where you have the urban woman. Who, yeah, she's busy, she's all of that, but she still wants to be involved. So it, there's the need for you to understand the separate people or the different users are forced. And then find a way to relate or get this information to them. Then I now come to my own people, which I'll say the technical. I'm a data analyst. So I would say there's also a need to be able to explain some of these things in a way that is very, very relatable. Recently, myself and my team, we did something for election. Um, know your candidates. So you can go to the platform, you click your location, you get all the candidates, the chairman, local government, senatorial, ministerial, all of that. You can get it. But one thing we realized is what about those that don't have access to network? So we decided that going forward, we're going to do the USSD version. And we're also going to do a version where you can assess information like that via WhatsApp. And another thing we realized from it that I would say was also a limitation is everybody gets triggered when you have to put in your location. So that was already an issue for that app. So by the time we checked, like after building and all of that, I started doing a lot. I, I did a, some form of sample units, you know. I sampled people around me. And I noticed that consistently that was a trigger. Nobody wants to turn on their location. I don't know about Kenya, but I know Nigeria. You don't want to turn on your location for nothing. I mean, if I'm going to, if you ask me to drop my location, I'll just give you maybe state and city. But turn on my location for you to pick my location, nobody. So that was like a deficiency for that app. And then you have stuff like that that are built. They are very lies. But the truth is, those that are supposed to assess it, what is their situation like? What, is, what are the triggers? So for a student who want to report rape issue, and I see questions that are quite biased. That's, I'm not doing that. So um, she says something, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't get her name. She mentioned something yesterday. Yeah, Rose. Yeah, but okay, yes. Yes, during our presentation. She was like, she was speaking to the lady. And then the lady had to say, because you're older, and you approached me in a subtle way. So sometimes we have perhaps chatbots or some of this AI stuff built. And you can sense bias from the question. So there was also a case where I stumbled on a page and we were talking about rape. And the writer already started from the note of, so what they wear, what were they wearing at that point? What, where were they? What have, okay, so I saw the data set and then the story they, or the insights they were able to bring out from the data set is most of those that get raped are students that attend parties. That's already bias. So if you want me to read or continue to enjoy your platform, that's a trigger, like I'm not doing that. I don't even want to be a part of whatever movement you're doing. So it's also from the part of, so let me just summarize this conversation. Part of you as a writer or a journalist, remove emotions from your statement. Remove bias from your statement. If you're going to go, the, just take off any form of bias or emotion. Don't reach out to people with your experience. Reach out based on the data or the information you have. I see a lot of writers say, I want to make a statement, but they already have a result they, ex they want. So while they are writing, they write not because of what they have. They just write based on the results they want it to be. And then there's bias already. So when you want people to relate with your story or the information you are putting out, the bias is there. Then another thing is, I'm sorry that I'm taking this while. I, I think over time, my company, has, um, the organization I work with has trained like 4,000 journalists. That's like, I just want to say the range because we do a lot of training for journalists. Another thing is ability for journalists to, as, to accept it that technology has come to stay. And it's not chasing the, it's not going to take anyone's job. The truth is there is no AI that does not get, AI cannot work on its own. 
It's the instruction or the algorithm the humans give to AI. So the chat GPT they all shout about. If you ask questions from chat GPT about recent data, maybe 2023, 2022 in fact, it's going to tell you what it has and it's going to tell you its limitation. It's going to say something like, the last stuff I have here is maybe 2020, you know, 2019, this uh, model got trained, blah, 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 2019. So for you to see that it's still input from humans. So at the same time, I also tell writers and journalists, it's just going to help you. You are not limited, it's not going to take your job, accept it. I have writers that, or journalists that, they say they want to get into the data journalism. There, at this stage, you even have to get into data, like you need to use data as a journalist or a writer. But you don't want to welcome Excel sheets. Like as simple as copy and paste, as simple as pivot tables. This is, they're very, very, like, they're not so hard. I just feel like it's just this close mind that, oh no, I just want figures. It's just going to make your work easier and interesting. And like he said, there are different ways to put out your story. I just mentioned TikTok. There was one, I do dashboards for my company, but at the end of the day, I realized that all they just want to pick is quickies. So I spoke to the writers that, okay, guys, <laughs> okay, he's looking at the quickie that I keep mentioning. That's what they want, really. So I told the guy that, okay, just I'll give you insight from it. And then they converted it using infographics and images that are quite relatable. So I'm speaking of a woman who needs to leave an IDP camp all the way, take a C or, or take a Keno to the next hospital just to give birth. And that story is not out. But that story, it's possible that the numbers are out, but people need to see visuals to relate with it. So I had to tell the guy that, okay, convert. So they converted into, into a video and it was on YouTube and it went boom. And we've been, we had it on our, on our website as dashboards and all of that for a very long time. So I'm just going to say this, as technical teams, let's try to make the data, the platform, the um, whatever product you're using, make it easy for those that are going to use it. As also writers, as journalists, identify your space identify the different set of people you have in your space and be ready to work to feed them regardless of how you feel regardless of the bias regardless of the emotion you already carry just be ready to feed the nature of people then i would then say the third part is as a journalist as a writer just welcome some of this technology you may, they are there to make life easy you have power automate that i see a lot of people that it's not, it's not big. Power Automate is just to help productivity in the office. Things like clock in, clock out, simple things that you want a secretary, all those kind of things to do. You just need someone to automate some of these processes at work. And it's done. Life is easy. You can do other stuff. So it's just the ability for us to be ready. But another thing is I hear people say, oh, it's not out there. There are a lot of organizations that are giving it free for women now. I know women in Data Africa. I know a lot. Google is even doing something specifically for women. I think almost every six, six months. Aside from that, there's also um, LinkedIn doing stuff for women, just women. So, and these things are very free online. Even with YouTube, whatever you really want to learn, you can learn it. It's just to be open-minded and be ready to learn it. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I really like what you say, how we put our content there. Mm. Philip, you also mentioned, you said like, you can write a report, but who wants to re read a report of 600 pages? Mm -hmm. You know, and people will just put it. But if we can take the contents of those reports and maybe create like a TikTok video out of it, just to make sure we, we pass the information. And also another thing she said, and which we, Kenya is known like, is a hub of innovation. You know, it's a hotbed of innovation, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. But that is when you come to Nairobi, when you go to like my village, we're still struggling with electricity, believe you or not. You know, we're talking about 2G there, and that is where, depending on where you're standing. You move a minute next, 
Sorry. You can't get network. So also those are some of the things that we also need to look at when we are talking about this digital uh, re re resilience workspace we are talking about. So I'm going to give uh, one person uh, an opportunity. How can we make this environment con conducive for people? <laughs> Thank you. Um, how do we make the environment conducive, uh, especially for women? One, we need uh, to have our local Africa. I'm talking about African women now. Yeah, both of those of urban and uh, rural women, for those who can access internet. Yeah, to have local 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 content. And for journalists, we really need to put local content because if we want uh, our women to uh, engage in, in, in the uh, online uh, discussions, they need what they know. They need to see their, their, sol uh, their solution-based content. If they have uh, no firewood, if there are no energy, what do they want? So we really need to have local content. But also we need to have products that are, are solution-based in their lives. Women are always about solutions on whatever they are facing. They are always about how their families, how their children can go to school, how their children can survive certain diseases, how they can survive in their own environment. Some of them are not even, I do not even think about the third world, I mean the the developing countries, they just think on how where they are and what they do and how they can survive. So we really need local content, African con in African context, whatever we are writing should be in African context. And we know that our African context is quite different to other contexts in the world. Thank you.